welcome to Cena Nerds. This is your bi-weekly podcast about reviewing movies and interviewing actors, actresses, directors, and all the sorts. My name is Isabel, and with me we have Orengo, Orengo yes. and Josue, and our special guest Laura Alman. Hi. Hello. <laughs> How are you guys today? All good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Happy to be here with you guys. Yeah. Yeah, doing good, recovering still from the holidays, but doing good otherwise. For sure, <laughs> and welcome to the first, se- well, first episode of season two. Yeah, right. <laughs> this long after a pandemic. Yay! <sighs> Woo! Nothing, no better way to pass a pandemic than starting up a podcast with your buddies. Yes, for sure. So, Laura, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, well, what can I say? I am a Puerto Rican living in LA, pursuing her career, her goal of being an actress and living out of what makes me happy. Yeah. And how did that start out? How did you, como te entro el querer ser una actriz? Well, it's crazy porque my mom was, um, she is a vocal coach of many people you probably grew up listening to either in commercials or um, like people like Jerry Rivera, Manny Manuel, Melina Leon, Don Omar, Daddy Yankee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and she used to be part of different um, performance shows where there would be acting involved as well. And that's how I started here and there, doing a theater play here, doing uh, Gerardito Los Rocolos in the studio, recording music or dancing and performing. And uh, one thing led to the other. I started doing um, theater officially when I was eight and then pass on to commercials when I was like around 14. Then the same director who I worked with, which was Marco Surinaga, which is who's a legend in um, Puerto Rican cinema, gave me the opportunity on my first feature film when I was 16. And then it just stumbled upon um, and I kept having uh, a lot of luck getting roles here and there. That's great. And you've done a lot as well. (laughs) And not just movies, reality TV show, too. Yeah. What is that? Uh, um, that is a show from Univision, which is uh, called Protagonistas. Um, the show is based on actors who can sing and dance as well. And they have all these great professors that train you and tailor you to be your best performer. Um, we had classes with Antonio Banderas, with Miguel Bofil, uh, Miguel Said, Flor Núñez. Laura Restrepo, and, and, and fin, un montón de profesionales with a lot of pedigree in the industry who helped us improve ourselves and get ready for the real world. And yeah, I won. I got the, I don't, it's not a crown, it's not an award, but I won a reality show. Yeah, the important thing is that, is that you won. Uh, yeah. So, so what was it like? What is it like? to be in like a reality show like that versus like on a commercial or a movie. Uh, and there's always the the question of how real reality TV really is. So uh, what can you tell us about that experience? Well, in my experience, it was pretty crazy. It's like a glorified prison. <laughs> um, I mean, there's many things that you get to experience and do on a daily basis that for sure are worth having the experience. Uh, but then there's this downside, which you're, you're limited in the studio. You don't have a pencil. You don't have access to any of your stuff. The production dictates what you get and what you don't. And they utilize certain um, things like personal belongings. They give more to one person trying to provoke um, animosity between uh, colleagues so that it creates conflict and then they kind of chop it in a way that makes you think that whatever argument is being presented is for the reason that they're saying but most of the cases are montages that they do we don't really know what's going on on editing room we yeah. are just there having an experience and they just manipulate us in the way they need to 
in order to get what they need for their for their content. Yeah, ever since I was a kid, I could always sort of tell there was something not right about reality TV. And then, especially nowadays, we keep getting stories of like, oh yeah, they basically manipulated the their stars to create conflict, and they would take a lot of conversations completely out of context. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, dear. it was a pretty. If, if I'm honest with myself, it was a pretty traumatic experience. Uh, yet I don't regret the process because I, I got to learn so many things, got to meet so many people, and I still have great friendship with a lot of the colleagues that I work with. So I guess it's a win-win situation. Not the mm -hmm. preferred way to go in, but I guess that we all have the experiences that we need to in order to tailor ourselves for, for our careers. You've worked on some um, web series. You you worked on some actual TV shows, some movies from Hollywood. How is that experience different from saying working on a short film? And I've seen a couple of your work because yo soy un cineasta y llevo trabajando en la industria hace tiempo, so yo visto ya para tu trabajo. Este, por eso quiero trabajar. Preguntarte los cortometrajes, actually. Pero how would that work be different, or how is the experience any different from trabajar una película local de aquí? Versus algo de Hollywood cuando vienen para acá y cuando es en LA. I mean, I think that every experience, whether whether if it's here um, or in Puerto Rico or if it's a short or or a feature or a big network project, um, it's all about the the collective. Really, I can't say there's a standard way for every production to like operate the same. There are regulations, of course, from the union that are followed and and are different when you work on a short film or on a local movie that's non-union. Um, of course, there are protocols that are different, but globalized is just the experience of the collective. Mm -hmm. um, if the collective is connecting with each other and they're all aligned with what they want to achieve, then it will be a pleasant one. If there's somebody who's not resonating with the dynamic or or it's not as organized, well, it's not going to be a pleasant uh, adventure, but you'll learn from it um, as well. I think that I've had amazing experiences doing short films and, and non-union features where everything has been so organized because of a lack of resources that it actually operates in a more effective way. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been in massive budgeted projects in which I've been waiting seven hours in a day to just be there 20 minutes on scene and step out and then have to come again next day, um, which I don't mind because at, at the end of the day, I'm getting paid to be there. So um, it just depends on the type of collective that you're working with and how how you resonate with the crew. Um, when you go about getting chosen for these roles or you look for these roles um what is the thing that hooks you is it the script is it the people behind it is it because it's an opportunity that you feel like you need to take or whatever like what are the hooks that kind of like make you want is it a genre thing what, 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 what would be the options well i i can't say there's a particular thing that always works with all productions that i've done i think that there has been projects that i feel are worth the try because it's a different character that I haven't played and I'm interested in doing the character and the story is interesting and the script is good and there's projects that I go in because I know most of the people and I like it. It's a good project. It's not a challenge personally, but it, it feels right and I'm I'm I want to do it. Um because it adds up to having more experience overall and having the opportunity to be in front of the camera and practice my craft. Um, there's other projects that are just, you know, things that I've produced because I need to portray, to, to create content around this particular character, which I want to achieve in a long term in my career. So there's not like a right formula how I choose my characters or my projects. I think that it's just it's relative again to to which projects are being offered and and which ones are being considered to. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've noticed in some of your films you're very comfortable with your own skin, but I understand that in those moments when you're being filmed, there can be a, some type of performance anxiety, in a way. And being us women, 
having in the society that we are, you know, sexualized and all that stuff. How do you go about it? Trying well, to I mean, go into the films industry. Um, it's interesting that that you mentioned being comfortable in my own skin. I feel like I've always been very open about my 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 body, yet being comfortable personally with myself and and portraying myself in a particular way is not the same as and being on set surrounded like hundreds of people looking at you while you're performing uh like uh an implied nude scene or implied sex scene like these are circumstances that are never comfortable to be around and as women in the in the industry it is very vulnerable to expose ourselves in in such a such a fragile environment especially with everything that has been happening in the industry for for such a long time and now finally it's coming up because of a me too movement and whatnot um myself as many colleagues included we've been victims of circumstances that are not necessarily um uh inviting to be comfortable on these circumstances yet it's part of my job and part of my job is also to take care of my mental health check in with myself talk to my team let them know what i'm comfortable with what i'm not comfortable with until what point i want to get um and there's always kind of that negotiation push from production because of course there's aspects that they want to portray that are necessarily resonating with you and they're always going to push But I think that um, with time, I've been able to acquire certain maturity and wisdom in, in terms of how to communicate what I need as a performer in order to do my my job in the most comfortable way and effective way for everyone. Um, and so I think that the answer to your question would be communication, just being able to tell them how, what I feel comfortable. I feel comfortable with a closed room where the DP, sound guy, camera, and director are present and there's a ward or a person immediate, immediately next to me so that when they cut, they cover me if there were to be an implied nudity. Um, at some point, I've negotiated being open to showing certain parts of my body and, and in other moments, I've said, no, I'm not up for it either because the storyline doesn't need it or I feel it's a gratuity thing um, or I'm just not feeling the vibe with the team. And so I think that it's it's just a matter of being in check with yourself and being clear of what you're comfortable with and being comfortable expressing that as a performer. Okay, so yo por lo menos tengo varios más. Mm -hmm. eh, es más de la película de Perfecto Afición, fue, o oh, Afición Perfecto. Perfecto. I always get them confused. I always get them like. <laughs> Top of the, what was your best and worst experience on set? I'm extremely best curious. Best experience. I think that when we were in Perfecto Anfitrión, when we were in the karaoke, we had so much fun having an open shot, being able to be ourselves and interact, and not necessarily follow a script, rather just feel ourselves it was the first day of shooting um i think was, it was the most a great way that's yeah a it was, way to break the ice actually yeah because uh, i mean there there's people who i've worked with before there was new people and you know it's always such a delicate situation when you know half of the people and you don't want to be like impertinent to the new uh the new colleagues and like not make them feel like you're taking over with your energy and whatnot I think it just flowed so nicely. It, it was the it was my favorite day of all shoot. Um, awkward, or, or I don't think that experience. I wouldn't call it that experience. I think that there were two situations. I think one was, of course, having that intimate scene with Alejandra and Pedro because mm -hmm. we're exposing ourselves in a circumstance that is not necessarily the most comfortable to be in. Mm -hmm. um, But still, it was very well managed. The crew, the director, everybody managed the whole scene with such uh, care and respect that it wasn't necessarily a bad experience. It's just awkward to, you know, mm -hmm. expose yourself in that way. 
Um, and another day, I think it was the last day of shooting. We had been doing a whole week and a half, two weeks, I think, of overnights. Um, and it was the last day. And the last three scenes were mine. It was one scene with the girls and Pedro in the pool. Um, and then right after, they had to get me ready to do the, the persecution and the and the the whole sequence, which you guys know, I don't want to spoil too much of the movie for those who haven't seen it. But the sun was about to start coming out and my hair got wet in the pool and it was it wasn't supposed to get wet. But, well, things happen. And so they had to dry my hair with chlorine on and like get me ready quickly to be able to finish. And it wasn't a bad experience because, again, everybody was in tune and everybody was in the same page together trying to make this happen but it's the stress and the anxiety wanting to like manage every single aspect okay my hair is ready what are my lines what is the action what, like we're running we have two shots for this let's do it let's go 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 it, it's um, also just kind of funny to think about you were you first filmed the scene where you are at a pool only to scramble because you're going to film a more intense suspenseful scene later yeah and it's cra it's crazy because that day it, it it rained. That's why everything got cramped up for the end, and we delayed during the shoot. Um, and we had to do it in that order for it to work. Because initially the pool th the pool scenes were the first ones to be taken that night, but because of the rain, we couldn't follow through. Um, and so it's like you're already panicky because the context of the scene is heavy and you're tired, you haven't slept for days, and this is the last shot of the movie and you want it to be the best, especially because it's on you. So it wasn't a bad experience again, but it was quite stressful. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had experiences like that in the last film that I shot right before the pandemic. I did two overnights with my crew, so we were both tired, especially the second night. And the last scene of the movie is the first shot of the film which is very important because that's how I start the movie. And it's my actor dancing for like a minute and a half. And we shot that like five times. And I'm telling him like, I'm good. I think I have the shot. It's like, I don't feel like I'm done. I want another one. And I'm like, my crew, we're all dying. But you really, you're all sweaty. And you really just want to do it again, right? And like, yeah, yeah, I got this. I got this. And then we, when he finished the scene, it was actually perfect. So props to him. Everyone left and he just died on the floor. He was just like, I'm going to go to sleep. Do not wake me up. And I'm like, okay, I'm really good. So I understand, especially when you're like scrambling to finish it because, you know, you have the location for a certain amount of days. Yeah. You have the crew for a certain amount of days. So you're going to like scramble to be able to finish everything. But it is a relief when you actually finish it and you feel like you finish it well. So yeah. I, I, I empathize with that a lot. It was um, funny because they, they flagged the whole car around because the last scene is me getting in the car and like doing the whole jam and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you got you guys have to watch a movie so you know what i'm talking yeah, about exactly. um, but but it's crazy because when we finished it was like 7 a.m the the sun was fully out but we were playing day for night uh mm -hmm. night for day i'm sorry mm -hmm. um and it was intense um but it was also so gratifying to know that it just finished in that moment mm -hmm. yeah. it's like a bittersweet kind of feeling all the time oh yeah hey yeah. and if nothing else that all that stress and intensity could be added into the scene, which is what it required anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So even outside, um, I guess, stimuli and help in acting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, yeah. I'm oh, sure yeah. Most, lots of actors can give you stories about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Speaking of which, how was working with Pedro? On Pedro Pedro. Pedro is like a brother to me. We've worked so much, but before that, we were friends for a long time. Um, I used to have a company with my my ex partner, and he used to be part of our our community every morning. And so, his kids, his family became my family, and so it's easy to be around him. Um, at to the point where production has to like tell us to shut up because we start like joking around too much and making too much noise while they're trying to make a movie. But yeah, it's it's always fun and it's it's pleasant to be able to do films with my friend. Um, so in terms of your own personal experiences and what you feel more comfortable with, do you 
do you generally like um, sticking to a script, like very much sticking to a script? Or do you like if the director gives you a little room to experiment, to do alternate takes, to work around the dialogue? Or are you more pur purist in that form? I think that it depends on the project. Because if mm -hmm. it's, let's say, an adaptation of William Shakespeare, I wouldn't dare to try to mm -hmm. change the text because it has a value it has a structure for a reason um if there is room for me to make my my dialogue my own um because there's words that i wouldn't necessarily use or my character wouldn't necessarily use uh then we normally work those things in rehearsal um and always get ready for the time that we have to shoot that scene particularly but um Of course, as a performer, I'm always gonna love having an open shot and be able to improvise and like, you know, play it, play a bit along the lines and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But not all productions have the the availability and the economy to give us that freedom. So, you know, it is what it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to ask for all your fans, what would you recommend to them if they want to follow the same path that you're taking what would you recommend what would be the tips and tricks of the industry um as in for them to be performers of course yes okay um if i were to give them an advice would be to prepare to study to practice to commit to their craft to look into writing and study scripts and dissect them ask questions if if you can't go further after a page ask questions why is it that i'm not clicking with this page why is it so hard to to understand um bring those questions into production dare to speak your voice and not not be arrogant be very humble about the opportunities that come your way but feel free to always have dialogues because as an artist you are there to create along your peers and sometimes you can you can improve the story with them having at least a, a shared perspective of what your goal is as your uh, in your character um and commit to the journey it's it's not it's not a a a velocity um, uh, career. It's not how fast you can get there. This is an endurance career. You really have to um, commit to the long-term uh, goals and, and work on the aspects that you know that can improve as a performer. Don't get comfortable with your goals and don't get too cocky about yourself because everybody's replaceable in this business and only those who actually embrace the opportunities work hard and and have discipline are the ones who go a long way it's not it's not only about talent Ta talent i would say is a five percent of this career you of course need talent to be able to convey emotions Um, but that you can acquire with practice, with discipline, with commitment to your craft. And the rest is just a matter of, uh, of a waiting game. How do, you, how do you gauge the landscape of la industria in Puerto Rico, but also um, this, this upbringing of diversity in Hollywood since it's cool because you work in both like the Hollywood system and you also work locally, you have a gauge of both of both um, paradigms. So how do you think the industry of Puerto Rico está ahora mismo moving forward, like say for the next few years and this um, injection of more inclusion and acceptance in these Hollywood productions? Look, I think that In terms of Puerto Rico, the island has overcome so many challenges um, and the industry as well has overcome so many challenges and limitations itself. I'm, I'm just in awe and admiration for 
what our fellow Puerto Ricans manage and push through to make their projects. Um, and I, I can't predict what is going to happen in the next few years because, you know, the island is changing so much in terms of politics and, and uh, regulations, and it's really hard to know what its future holds. But at least from the quality of the material that is coming out, is very it has a very promising future. I think that talent-wise, we have the talent, we have the knowledge, we have the equipment, we have the capability, and we have so many stories to tell and such a rich culture to portray um, so I can only hope and declare that it will continue being successful and evolving, um, with all these changes and, and, and solidifying itself. Um, in terms of the inclusion in Hollywood, I think that we still have a long way to go. Um, and yes, there are many changes happening, but I think it's, it's like every trend. Uh, there is a moment where Afros were a trend. There was a moment where skinny tall girls were the trend and like red haired were the trends like now latinos are the trend because of the circumstances that we've endured and puerto ricans particularly um but there's still a long way to go for us to get to that uh gender gap that minority gap and and to have equal opportunities and stories as any other race or or identity. Um, I think that there's so much work to be done, not only for Latinos, but for women. There's so much that has happened in, in decades of this industry with gender itself that adding the equation, having a different nationality or being part of a minority, um, there, there are moments where there's shining light above us and looking like there's going to be progress. And yes, there, there is progress happening, but there's so much still to be done. So in, in my opinion, I think that this is a great moment for all of us Latinos um, to commit to telling our stories, to start looking for ways of, of, of being true to our identity and pushing forward those um those stories that are important to us in order to succeed as Latinos, to create that diversi diversification of our image that we're seeking for in our performances. Okay. So speaking of performances as an actress, is there any particular type of role, be it from like an adaptation or, or any sort of archetype you would love to play that it's like this is my dream goal to play yes um i'm working in several things that i've been wishing for a while um and i'm pretty sure you guys have potentially heard this before but my dream role has always been uh lolita lebron um nationalist puerto rican idol to me there's a lot of people who have a lot of controversy with her image and and her, uh, her existence overall. Um, to me personally, it represents so much. I come from uh, very strong roots, uh, Puerto Ricans who defend our island and our culture. And, and so for those reasons, I resonate a lot with what her life mission was. And it would be an honor for me to portray her uh, another person, Silvia Resach, is also one of those uh, idols that I've always looked up to, to since I was a kid. Um, it's also a very controversial uh, image for Puerto Ricans because she was a very talented uh, poet and writer and, and, and composer. Um, but she also had alcoholism problems and had a lot of conflict and bad press as a woman and i resonate with her because i think that as a as a as a puerto rican woman i'm i'm always categorized and put in a box of oh well you're latina and you're puerto rican so you're spicy and sexy and yeah. hot and 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 uh intense and passionate and and explosive and 
there's no room to actually be myself and bring myself to the room because there's already a preconception of me. And that's why I choose these roles as role models and idols because they didn't give a fudge about what people thought. They went for their goals and their visions and their ideals and stood up for them and weren't shy about it. And that's why I'm so passionate about having the opportunity to interpret one of them. Yeah, th this also ties back to what you were saying earlier, like how, well, we've come so far, but there's still so much further we can go. Kicks in oh, point, yeah. how they always want to typecast you as the as the sexy, sassy Latina. And it's like, you yeah. know, there's there's more to my people and my culture than just the, the, the sexy spiciness, you know? Yeah, there's also conservative women. Yeah. Go <laughs> <No> figure. <laughs> like, like I've, se I've seen how they portray... Uh, oh, uh, Latina women in movies. I'm like, my grandma would never have done that. She was my very modest. Would, my grandma would never let me watch that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Um, so we know that you filmed a feature with Benji, uh, Benji yes. Lopez. Yeah. That was, it hasn't been released yet. And it's yeah. called Amor en 266 Millas, si no me equivoco. ¿Qué tú puedes decirnos de eso? What can you tell us about it? Mira, esta película de Benji has been one of my favorites so far. I have to admit, we 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 committed to that project uh, like never before. We went through crazy experiences that I I treasure. Um, it's great. I I saw it and let me wanting left me wanting more. Um, which is rarely the case. I can I can say that almost no, it, it never happens really. There's great films, but it never feels the same way where you're like, oh my God, is it done? Is it like, is there another like clip that I'm going to watch at the end of credits? What's up? <laughs> um, so it was very fun. It was entertaining. It was great to work with my friends. Um, it's beautifully shot. Um and I can't wait for it to be out and for you guys to be able to see it because it's one of the projects I've been looking forward to seeing in the big screen. And we can't wait to see it too. Yeah. yeah. We're excited. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great project. Benji did an amazing job and I can't wait to work with him again. He's he's one of a kind. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. How was it working with Benji Lopez? Benji is fun and nice and easygoing and and a conflict solver. I remember one day I got I got in early and we ha we had to change the sequence and my colleague was in makeup first and and then they were rushing me into the scene. I was like, well, man, but I've been here for a while and you guys didn't do anything. I don't want to go looking like this. Like, and he came to the chair and he was so nice and I then I felt like an ass because I was you know behaving a bit diva ish and. <laughs> It wasn't diva -ish. it was really i mean you you don't want to look bad in, on screen you want to look your best and not mm -hmm. be rushed and like have all red patches around and look like you got being the or just woken up mm -hmm. but you know you get my point but benji just made every single day such a smooth experience and he felt like that big wise brother who knows exactly what needs to happen for it to work and doesn't take too much because he's such a good director and he's so connected with each one of the characters that he wrote on the page. So, so it's just fun and smooth. And I wish all, all my projects were like him. Like all my directors were like him. Eh, también igual con, con, con Ariel in Perfecto Anfitrión. I think that they are both such easygoing people and such uh calm calm personalities that it's just easy to work with <laughs> that's really great yeah to be honest you don't get to hear that much of the connections and como se tratan unos al otro on set yeah Especially entre actore versus di uh, directore sí, so okay. benji and benji and ariel has I, I most I think I create such a strong bond with the directors that I've worked with because it's such an important thing to me to be able to 
understand what they want and connect on a personal level. And Benji and Ariel has have been by far my my favorite directors. Okay. Uh, has it been an interesting experience in working, for example, with Benji, with Douglas, with CJ? Like, working with these, like, essentially new wave directors that are up and coming and doing their projects on the screen? Like, do you, do you like being a part of that, like, new wave, por decirlo así, de, de cine de aquí? Oh, for sure. I think that's a privilege. Because when you're, when you're starting, when, when you are in a project of a, of a upcoming director, um, and you get to somehow mold yourself to their perspective. Um, it it just feels it it feels refreshing because it's nothing like you've ever experienced before. Um, but it also kind of gives you that tingly of wait, this is the beginning of a long relationship that I'm gonna em embark now. Um, and so you go in with that responsibility in mind, uh, wanting to, wanting to give your very best for them to enjoy the process, and to feel that you are aligned with what they need as as storytellers. Um, so yeah, I feel I feel it's a very big privilege to be able to like for CJ. CJ. CJ has been one of those friends and directors who there's not much needed to be said because his scripts basically just tell you what it is not because it's on the nose but because it's so well defined the characters are and the storyline are so well defined that you can't go wrong with what's written in the page um with benji is just fun his scripts are fun he's fun everything that he proposes has a rhythm and you feel like you're part of that rhythm and you want to continue having like that interaction and that opportunity to be on set and have that dynamic because it doesn't come often like to be able to connect in such a genuine way and create a relationship like that is rarely the case so when you do have it because it's a new wave director, it's an upcomer, then then you really treasure it and you want to be part of it and you want to continue nurturing that relationship because who knows that could be that could be the person that could be your Scorsese. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'm gonna let fast forward a little bit right now. So, cómo ha ido buscando trabajo, buscando roles durante pandemia? Ha sido una jornada muy interesante. It's different because you don't go to the room anymore. Um, and when you do, it's already like pretty ahead in the process. Um, it's weird because of course you have the opportunity to tape yourself 130 times, but you don't have the ability or the space to connect with the people in the room. And I think that's really what, what makes an impact at the end of the day. You could be a great performer, but if you don't have chemistry, and you can't showcase your own self um there's kind of like a disconnect from everything and it's just more impersonal and and it's harder to book that way um because when you when you book a role you're booking the room with who you are you're not booking the room with your work only it's it's a sum of all and so it's been interesting it's been challenging it's pushed me to like approach things in a different way to try different formats to go back to classes and try different approaches um so yeah it's been it's just been <laughs> yeah i can imagine it must be tough you, uh, i suppose if you do a great monologue that'd be awesome but some roles require you to bounce off your co-stars and and I suppose they could try that through like a Zoom call or something, but it's not the same as having your fellow actor with you to bounce off of. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, you get four auditions and between those four auditions, you have 30 pages and then you have to manage memory, wardrobe, getting a good reader, having a good setup and being in the right mood and energy to bring to the character. And so... You know, it's it's hard to it's hard to 
push when you have like your dog, your neighbor's dog barking or, or your grandma screaming or <laughs> whatever it is. There's always a, an extra challenge to taping at home and like not being able to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. You're just trying to audition like a really sad scene where you have to cry on camera and then your dog comes in trying to see if you're okay. It's like, no, 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 baby, it's, I'm okay, I'm okay. It happens a lot. Like, you know, I, I try to be as prepped. I have my lights already set up. My my wall is painted, so I don't even have to bring us like a backdrop down. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's business. Um, there's a news that came out recently that in Canada they're regulating the amount of material that you can get per week per character and the amount of time they give you for prep. Uh, it's like something like more than three pages. You need a whole week. You have like by law, you need a whole week. Here in LA, that's not the case. Sometimes you have 30, 40, 50 pages to learn in like no time, two days with like mm -hmm. several characters. Sometimes you have to read the whole script because you have the opportunity to read the script and you don't sleep for days. And then you have three days where you don't do anything in the weekend and you get to rest and repeat. Um, so it's not an easy job, especially with the pandemic because of all the environmental challenges with a lack of connect connection with the amount of material that they submit you for um and any other element like health and you know and mood and resting and um so yeah it's just it's just different and weird but at the same time i've gotten great opportunities throughout the pandemic i got signed with apa which is one of the top agencies theatrical agencies in the industry so there has been things happening there's projects coming up for netflix and hbo and whatnot but it's just so everything is so impersonal unless you're in a set and even then it's just so disconnected because of the whole COVID situation mm -hmm. okay yeah I mean, it's completely understandable too. And especially when you're wearing a mask on set. Yeah. There's no way to emote or anything just to say, like, hey. Yeah. And it's also some conversation. It's like, wait, I have to kiss this person. Yeah. Like anxiety just comes up. Exactly. That's like, how, like, how, how much? It's like, <laughs> uh, uh, you poke him in the nose one more time. <laughs> the director's like, it's, a, it's like, Lara, uh, this scene calls for a romantic. I'm getting deathly and anxious out of you. <laughs> yes, Mr. Director, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. 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 And that stuff is going to happen, but it's good that you know how to manage it, at least. I mean, it's, do you do you really know, though? <laughs> <laughs> know how to manage things like that? You never really. I think that's just so, it's so bizarre because you never know what you're going to get. Um, yeah, I, I just sure. gotten sheer lucky because I remember my starting years when I was not that I'm someone, but at least some people know me in the industry. So it's easier to manage and they, they there's so validation. But when you don't have any validation at all, they don't make it easy on you. They will try to break you and try to prove, uh, try to test how committed you are to this journey. And so I feel lucky to be in the place I am and to have had all these opportunities and challenges because they made me the performer I am and the professional I am nowadays. I mean, okay. speak, speaking of performer, you're not just an actress. You've done in film, you've done film, you've done TV, commercials, plays. You're a singer, you, you're a dancer, you're a performer. Yeah. Which one which one would you say would be like your favorite? Man. If you have one. Musical theater. <laughs> I mean, it's like so wherever I get to do everything. I, I just like to create. I'm I'm a Pisces with an ascendant on cancer, whoever follows the charts. Um I I am all emotion and living in a cloud and thinking of unicorns and horses and doggies and world peace kind of girl <laughs> so being able to perform and play is biggest gift I, yeah. I don't care if it's singing or acting or dancing but if i get to do all of them at once i mean it doesn't get any better okay and i do have one more question and you as an actress 
what is your opinion on future films when it comes to theater versus streaming? I think that both have their space. I think that in this in this day and age, streaming services have given us the opportunity to continue feeding that creative need and uh, connect them with uh, great storytellers. Um, the theater is just magical experience where you get to share that energy with the people in the room and 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 have this amazing system and 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 experience sensorial experience in general that that of course is always going to be magical so i think that both are are a great source for us performers to keep working and to keep reaching more people and and telling more stories do you like working more in long form content, meaning like uh, web series or TV shows or streaming shows? Or do you like having like a very concise character that you get to work on for like two or three weeks in a movie? Man, if I if I if I'm honest, if I could, I would always choose long format. Okay. Um, I as a performer, you don't get to really connect with much people and have solid relationships because if your if your circle is not working with you then you barely get to see them either they're in another project or or they're not in the industry so their times are different than you and so it's it can become a very lonely career but when you are in long term projects, you you develop it's always like a family, even if it's two, three weeks, even if it's two days. Um, but when you get the opportunity to be with like minded peers who love creating and love playing and and become your, part of your community, it's it's everything you ever wish for. You You have everything there. You have your family, you have your friends, you have people that understand your good days and your bad days and relate to you in a personal level and a deeper level. So I, I would always choose long form over anything else. Yeah. Okay. I, I suppose that's why when a long running series finally comes to an end, there is a lot of, it's a better, very bittersweet moment. Yeah. One day I'll get one of those Grey's Anatomy long form projects. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And then, and then we're gonna watch you in the behind the scenes of when it's finally ending, and you say goodbye. And it's gonna be a real tearjerker. It's been fifty-two years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're nearing the end of the episode. And uh, is there any future projects you would like to tell your view, the viewers, your fans that are coming For up? Sure. Um, so Perfecto Anfitrión, you can find it in Pantalla. You can watch Pantalla through Amazon or directly through their app or website. Um, it's a great movie. Uh, it's a suspense thriller and there's a lot of hot people in it. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, um, another movie coming up to theaters and then to Netflix called the system, uh, leaded by Tyrese, uh, uh, Howard Terrence, and Jeremy Piven. I am uh, part of the cast and very excited for that project. Also, there is Casa Grande coming soon on HBO Max, um, a series about immigration and agriculture in the 70s. Um, love the project from ESX Entertainment. And also, Amor en 266 Millas, whenever it comes out. <laughs> I wait for all of them, to be honest. Yeah. And honestly, thank you for being here with us and sharing your stories, your views, and everything. For really, sure. from the bottom of our hearts, thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for making the space for me and, and yeah, and, and inviting me to your show. Awesome. It's always a pleasure. So, now that we're done, my name is Bells. You can look for me on Instagram at Libros de la Brua and here by Weekly. This is the first episode of season two. So watch where it comes. We're going to have a lot of content coming up. Mm -hmm. Nice. Take it away, bro. Este, you can find me at 
with you guys is Cine Nerds the next being Report. you can find me at the movie guy and Cinemas Podcast where I talk about movies and also you can find me in Producina Targeto where this year hopefully I'll start submitting my film to festivals to see where it goes you know este, Josue where can they find you as usual other than the show I don't I don't really do much of anything I simply go back into my lair and hibernate until I am summoned again <laughs> I am saying I will say this though uh, we've been talking with the team and I need to do a bit more research but we are working on some special episodes where the two movies we review are gonna be Oscar winners and one of the Oscar runner-ups and we're gonna discuss of whether or not we think the that movie was deserving of the of the Oscar. Uh, that's a, that's a project I'm looking forward to. It should be interesting. Exciting. Well, that's all, folks. See you Bye, in the next one. Guys. Bye.